Well, the, the, what we know is that the uh, Turkish Cypriots who are of uh, recent Turkish Irish origin, let's put it that way, are very much more observant, and that is evident to anybody who walks apart, uh, around in the north of the island, far more observant uh, than are, in a traditional sense, uh, than are uh, tradition, Turkish Cypriots who have been, their families have been hundreds of years on the island. Um, so that is clear. And that means that they will be more easily influenced by the Turkish government, which is, after all, an explicitly religious government. Uh, it is not, it says it's secularist, but it is introducing religion more and more into more and more aspects of Turkish life. Now, uh, the interesting question, I'm going to start with two stories which are jokes, um, and then I'm afraid I'm going to have an answer to questions, because I won't, an end to questions, because I've got to say at least ten minutes, I've got ten minutes at least to say something more, uh, so that you can ask more questions. Um, two jokes about uh, the Greek Cypriot situation and the church in Cyprus. Joke number one is an absolutely true story. The uh, archbishop, the present archbishop, expostulates with fury uh, to George Yakovu, who told me the story. Uh, and he said, how is it possible that 20% of the population demands 50% of the power? George Jacobo looks at him and he says, with the same logic that you, with 8% of the vote, ask for 100% of the power. <laughs> well, I thought that was rather a good reply. And it's well worth relating. So, that's uh, point number one. Point number two is, I think, more subtle. Uh, in 2003, there was a meeting, Chatham House Rules Applied, so I can't give names, at which Alvaro de Soto was president, incidentally, in Istanbul, uh, uh, at the Swedish Consul General, once the Swedish Embassy, Consulate General, at which a left-wing Turkish Cypriot leant over the table to a left-wing Greek Cypriot, and he said, Mr. So-and-so, don't give names, there's one thing I can't understand. I hear that Akel receives money from the Orthodox Church of Cyprus. Can it be true? Reply of the senior Akel person. Yes, of course it's true. All parties in Cyprus receive money from the Greek Orthodox Church, so why shouldn't we? <laughs> and in any case, although I am a Leninist, Marx and Lenin were wrong that opium is the religion of the people. O religion is no longer the opium of the people. It is football and television. <laughs> that was the reply. <laughs> so, you may be absolutely certain that if push comes to shove in a referendum in the Greek Cypriot community, the bishops will divide. And those bishops who, A, are giving financial support to Akel already, and B, have been supported in some shape or form by Akel, will, if Akel is supporting, as there will not be a referendum if Akel is not supporting it, will support it. And the issue will then be that the Archbishop will be against, because he comes from a hardcore nationalist position, but he represents 8 to 10 percent of the church body, which is 50 percent of the 50 percent, this is, must be the only church in the world today, or in Europe certainly today, where 50 percent of the population got out and voted for their, who should be Archbishop. When you come to think of it, can you imagine what proportion would turn out to vote for an Archbishop of Canterbury <laughs> if there was an election for Archbishop of Canterbury? They should join, they should join the election <laughs> either presidential Please. or uh, parliamentary. So, See, uh, but in, in any event, the, the, point, the point is that the Archbishop is doing everything he can, but he acknowledges that he's doing it personally as Archbishop. He is not doing it on behalf of the full Synod of the Church. The issue will be whether those bishops who are closer to the sea will support a yes vote in a referendum. That is a very crucial question. Very crucial question. And that we cannot know until we have the terms of a possible referendum on the table. That we can't know. I think, okay. I think we've call, got call to the stage, to having, yes. uh, having decided that God's on the side of Cyprus, yeah. um, I forgot to say... We've got, okay. we've got. <laughs> I, well, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm an atheist. Um, uh, uh, Costa, if you just uh, develop your argument, yes. and then we'll come back to questions, and we're finishing at half or so. Well, what I wanted to say very, very briefly is that, as you all know, there are certain areas on which there has been progress, and there are certain areas on which there may be progress, and on the certain areas on which there have been no progress, hardly even been discussed. 
And the issue on which there has been no progress and hardly ever been even be discussed is the issue of security and guarantees. And we in the Greek-Turkish Forum are doing work privately on that. The Greek and Greek Cypriot uh, um, members have worked very hard on making, not on negotiating, which we don't negotiate, we are private individuals, we don't represent our other country at all, but we try and put forward ideas to see whether those ideas uh, can, our Turkish colleagues can see them in a, as helpful, and if they are helpful, then we pass them around internationally and see you know, whether they can be the base of something. Because so far, nothing has happened on that issue. And if the danger is that we run out of time on that issue. Because at the present moment, there is no give on any side on that issue. Um, on those issues, rather. One thing is clear, that there will not, under any circumstances, be a settlement without a UN resolution under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. That is absolutely clear. Now, that was the crucial thing which sunk the Annan plan. Uh, you remember what happened? Even after the famous Papadopoulos address, asking for a no vote, Akel still said, we leave the issue open, we want a resolution under Chapter 7. And the US and the United Kingdom said no. The only bits that we're prepared to put under Chapter 7 are the movement of arms, which of course interested Turkey not the sanctions if something goes wrong, if the Turkish army doesn't withdraw, if, 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 all the various things that could go wrong, or if the Greek Cypriots behave badly for that matter. And that was the decisive thing. So that is absolutely clear. That message needs to be widely absorbed within the Turkish Cypriot community and in Turkey. That is the most important red line of all red lines. Compared with that, even the guarantee issue is one which can be negotiated. Because some sort of treaty implementation is going to have to be. And that treaty of implementation, implementation, however it's described, is going to give certain, under certain circumstances, rights to do various things to various parties. I'm not going to go into the details. I don't have the time. I'm glad to. I've got it all in writing. I have lots of uh, suggestions, individually as a person, and um, more generally. But I'm not going to go into details now. Because it's that's not the point. The point is to get over very clearly that the UN is going to have to play a long-standing, ongoing role in Cyprus if there is a settlement. B, the European Union is also going to have to play an ongoing role. How? O opinion, public opinion polling in the Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriot communities alike show that everybody, including the Greek Cypriots who would have the most to lose, are prepared that the EU, by qualified majority vote, which means that the Greek Cypriots, the Cypriots state of Cyprus would not have a, nor Greece, would have, not have stop, a veto power, because qualified majority that wouldn't allow uh, those two countries. And Cyprus, anyhow, would, be, would not be able to vote, because the Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots would disagree on such an issue, to take very tough measures, economic measures, and the tough measures that the European Union can take are very tough economically, as Greece is discovering today, uh, in the event that somebody doesn't carry out their work, their, their obligations. So you would not have to wait for a breakdown and for blood in the streets if a court decision is not implemented, if uh, one or other of the two sides are in clear bleak breach of a European Union regulation or of the Constitution, the European Union would be able to say no funding for that federated state or whatever. 